waiting on me. Sorry, I'm running a little late today. I have been meaning to talk to you, so it'd be great to catch up today. You will have to take some notes, but before we get to that, I just want to commend you all on the great job you're doing with Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare is not easy to understand. His plays have language that's difficult, and sometimes the topics are difficult to understand, especially since it was written so many years ago. And that's why I'm doing this video lecture, is because there's some things that I need to discuss with you to hopefully help you understand where Shakespeare was coming from and some of the choices he made as a playwright. I mean, look at the tights issue. Some of you really get hung up on the fact that men are wearing tights in the video. But in Shakespeare's time, wearing tights was perfectly acceptable for men to do. That's just one example of how looking at it from a modern perspective is not fair to Shakespeare or to the play. So there's a few things that I need to tell you, um, a couple of terms that we need to go over. I'm gonna have you take some notes. I know it's not fun to take notes, especially when you're trying to watch a video, you'd rather just sit back and watch it. But I want you to have these in your notes because you will see them on an upcoming quiz. The way I want you to take notes is a little bit different though. I want you to draw a visual of what I'm talking about. There's two terms. So on the front side of your paper, you can draw a visual of the first one and then jot down some notes. Don't have your visual take up the entire page, maybe about half of it, and then save some room for notes. And then the other term that I'm gonna talk about, you can put on the back side. Well, I'm not quite ready, just a minute. I need to open Coke Zero. Yes, this will help me. Hopefully you got your notes, something to write with, and you're ready to go. Number two, here we go. <sighs> How refreshing. Hey, my notes are up here, so if I kind of do this, it's because I'm looking up at my notes. I'm gonna try to put some pictures on top of my face so that you don't see me do that, but occasionally you might see that. So that's why I'm not really just rolling my eyes at you. I'm looking up to look at my notes. All right, on the front side of your paper, you should have a title. What we're going to talk about on the front side of your paper is called The Great, G-R-E-A-T, Chain, as in Chainsaw, of Bean. So write Great Chain of Bean. Now what I want you to draw for visual is a ladder. I'll explain why. But just draw a ladder and then I'm going to tell you some things to put on each rung as you move your way up the ladder or down, whichever way you want to start. The great chain of being, that's what we're going to talk about. Well, you might be saying, what is it? Well, if you think of a ladder, a ladder kind of represents a hierarchy of order. Well, that's how people in Shakespeare's time viewed society. Kind of like classes that we have now. People who might be wealthy or celebrities feel like they're above people like us, commoners, like teachers and students. And then down below us would be things like animals, plants. Okay, so in Shakespeare's time, it's really no different than kind of the class society that we have now. Only it was slightly different because they put a lot of emphasis on where a person was on that ladder and that you shouldn't try and be on a different rung if you're not. Okay, so at the top of your ladder, I want you to write God or Supreme Being or Creator of the Universe, whatever you want to put. Okay, and then just below that would be angels. Okay, and then just below the angels would be people like, if you're Catholic, it would be the Pope. Could be kings and queens below that. And then there would be people like archbishops, dukes, duchesses, bishops, and so on in that clergy associated with the church rung. Another person that would fall into that category of being associated with the church and therefore having a higher status on the ladder would be priests or preachers and nuns because they would be associated with the church as well. Okay, then just below those affiliated with the church would be the commoners or the working class. Um, of course, depending on your job and your occupation, you would be higher on the ladder of the great chain of being. So it depended on what your occupation was. Of course, people who were merchants, tradesmen, might be higher than those who were farmers, for instance. Okay, and then working your way down, of course, people who just did uh, menial tasks like servants or even actors or gypsies for that matter, 
they would fall under uh, most of the working class because remember actors were not a real high regarded profession even though people like to go see the plays they didn't have a lot of respect for the people who were performing in front of them okay another distinction that we need to make in this category of mankind was that women were just a rung below men um, didn't matter what their occupation was even like the nuns would be slightly below the priest in terms of their rung but in the working class or where the mankind classification is, I just need to make it clear that there's a distinction, of course, and we notice that in Shakespeare's play already, that there's a distinction between what men and women can and cannot do. Okay, then just below mankind would be animals. Okay, and the animals even had their own classification based on what type of an animal they were, right? So like a lion could be really high on the rung, whereas something like a caterpillar would not be very high, even though it turns into a beautiful butterfly. Okay, so I need to make that distinction that in mankind there was a lot of different uh, statuses, and then the same thing with animals. Then just below animals would be plant life, and below plant life would be minerals, and below minerals would be rocks. And then inanimate objects would fall probably below rocks or with rocks because they just sit there. They don't do anything. Okay, so hopefully you have some of those things on the rung and of each ladder. And you can see how for all the way from Supreme Being all the way down to the rock, you have this hierarchy uh, or classification of everything in the universe. Now you might be asking yourself, just where did this great chain of being originate it, and why did people believe in it anyhow? Well, it actually originated in the Middle Ages or Medieval period, which was just before the Renaissance, and it carried over into the Renaissance period. And if you think about it, this great chain of being is really still prominent in our society today. If you think about it, don't we as humans kind of think that we're above animals? If we didn't, we wouldn't be taking their lives so freely. So the great chain of being has been around for centuries, only in Shakespeare's time it was more prominent and therefore it influenced his writing and it would have influenced the audiences that were viewing his plays. Well, why was the great chain of being so important? There's two examples I want to use to illustrate this. The first example has to do with women and their place on the great chain of being. Remember I said earlier that women were a rung below men and just a rung above animals? Well, that's important to note here. And I'm not saying this just to sound like a uh, feminazi. I'm saying it because it was a reality in Shakespeare's time. Women, remember science hadn't proved anything, so women were blamed if they couldn't produce a male heir. And it was also believed that women's brains were smaller. Of course, science came along to disprove this, that we all have the same size of brain. So there's been a lot of advancements in terms of women's movement and what we can do in society today. So that's why it's important to look at it from Shakespeare's point of view. So if women were a uh, rung below men and just above animals, that would have meant that occasionally women might have animalistic instincts. Okay couldn't control their urges or couldn't control what they said in public and so they weren't necessarily educated or expected to do much besides be domestic goddesses. The other example that I want to use has to do with where people of the church fell on the rung. Notice their placement is right below God or the creator of the universe. So they would have been seen like man's avenue to talk directly to God or as close as you could get it and it would have been seen to have somewhat divine powers and that's why people in Shakespeare's time had a really high regard for people of the church and went to them when they needed help in fact it's not much different than society today right we often find people who will go to the church as a way to get not only counseling on their religious life, but just counseling in general. Now the last point I want to make in regards to the great chain of being is how it relates to Shakespeare specifically. Now I'm not going to say that Shakespeare always wrote and used the great chain of being as an influence on his writing, 
but you need to know that it was prominent during the time period and may have influenced the way he wrote. He did occasionally break from the norm. Shakespeare was not exactly one to follow society's code of order. In fact, I would say that he was probably a true maverick of his time. But in just looking at this play, Romeo and Juliet, there's a couple of very prominent examples to point this out. For instance, let's talk about the nurse. If the nurse is on the great chain of being, where would she be? She's a servant, so therefore she would be towards the bottom, plus she's a female servant. So she would have been really low on the great chain of being. I mean, if there was one step above an animal, that would be the nurse. And she does come across as being kind of a body or that's B-A-W-D-Y, or vulgar character, meaning that she has no social etiquette whatsoever and says whatever comes to mind. Now, this is one example of how the great chain of being might have influenced the way he wrote the nurse character. She has no social etiquette and seems kind of animalistic in a sense. The other example that I would use is how Romeo and Juliet confide in the Friar Lawrence. The Friar was a priest and therefore it was common for people to confide in a priest with things that were troubling them or to seek help in a situation, which is exactly what Romeo and Juliet both do. They go to the Friar and expect him to intervene on their behalf. All right, now we're going to move on to the other term that I'm going to discuss in this video lecture. So while you flip your paper, I'm going to have another sip. Ready? So the title for this one is Boethian Will. Let me spell that for you. B-O-E-T-H-I-A-N. Will. I hope you know how to spell will, right? So you can guess what the visual is going to be for this one. I want you to draw a wheel. Doesn't have to be fancy or anything, just a circle with some spokes. Okay, at the top of the wheel, I want you to draw a little stick man. Okay, standing upright. At the bottom of the wheel, I want you to draw that same stick man, but he's upside down. Like the wheel turned, and now he's upside down with his head pointing down. Okay? Done with your stick man? Okay, now you're wondering, what in the world did I just draw? Well, that's a visual for the Boethian Will, which is what I'm going to talk about. All right, the first thing I'm going to cover with the Boethian Will is telling you what it is. It was sometimes referred to throughout history as the Will of Fortune. No, it's not the game show that we watch on TV, but it does have some similarities or correlations to that game show. But more importantly, the Boethian Will represents the rise and fall of mankind. It's simply a visual to show you what was thought of in society in terms of how mankind could fall from fortune or rise up to power. For instance, at the top, the man who's standing upright on your Boethian Will, the little stick man, could be very powerful, have a lot of wealth, but if he or she made the wrong decision, the wheel would start turning and before long, he or she would have their eventual ruin or perhaps death. On the other hand, a person who is at the bottom of the wheel, meaning the upside down stick picture, they might make a great decision in their life that would cause the wheel to turn as well and eventually they would rise to power. But where in the world did this Boethian Will concept come from? Well, it dates back to a Christian philosopher named Boethius, thus the name Boethian Will. He was about 6th century, and it was named after him because he wrote a book while he was in prison waiting his execution. Yeah, he was convicted of treason, and so they were going to kill him. So the whole time he's sitting in prison, he had nothing better to do, and he wrote a book about this philosophy. But actually, the idea or the concept of a wheel of fortune or a wheel of fate playing in our lives dates back clear to the time of Cicero, 
which would have been about 100 BC. But because Boethius is the one who wrote about it so detailed in his book, we often give Boethius credit for it. But let's just say he isn't the real creator. Why is it important that we understand the Boethian will? It's not very different than the way present society views things. If you think about it, when things happen in the world, don't we tend to blame somebody for it? In fact, we might say, well, why do bad things happen to good people? Or did they make a wrong choice and that's why that bad thing happened to them? However, most people in today's society really don't believe that some supernatural force is playing out in our lives and causing bad things to happen. Instead, we tend to feel the exact opposite, that when things go wrong, it's really the person's own fault. We blame the person instead of some supernatural force determining our destiny. Just how does the Boethian will relate to Shakespeare? Even though Shakespeare wrote many years after Boethius was around and wrote his book, the Renaissance period was still influenced by the Boethian will and believed in it that there was some fate or supernatural force at play in their lives. Therefore, when characters like Romeo make the wrong decision and go to the Capulet party, despite him having a dream that something bad was going to happen, and even though he had misgivings about going, he went ahead and went anyhow. Well, a Shakespearean audience would have looked at that and known that the wheel had just turned and he would eventually be doomed. Now, whether that meant he was going to die is questionable, but possibly they knew his death was coming. Also, when Romeo and Juliet meet and realize that they're from opposing families, the Shakespearean audience would have also looked at that and said, not only is Romeo doomed, but she is as well, because the wheel had just turned for both of them, and now they were gonna have a tragic ending. Wow, that wraps up another edition of this video lecture, and whoa, the time has really gotten away from me. I've spent my whole afternoon doing this, and I still haven't finished my pop, so hey, have a good afternoon, and uh, get going on that online posting and character book. Talk to you later. Bye. Go now. See you later. So there's still a stratosphere of that's why Shakespeare uh, used it or well let's take for example